All right, we'll just give uh, everyone a few moments to join us. People are coming into the room now. Cool. Good afternoon, everyone joining us. I'm just hoping, as usual, these I don't get the uh, delivery drivers turning up. It always, it always <laughs> seems to know when I'm doing a webinar because I have a very large dog. <laughs> it's going to be a bit distracted. <laughs> Ah, uh, with well, these days with all the post tracks on, I never know when things are and aren't turning well, up. <laughs> there is that. There is that. Welcome everyone who's joining us. I see there's some more people still coming in, so we'll just give it a couple of minutes. Right, I think uh, I think we'll make a start. So, welcome everyone to the Ground Source Heat Pump Association's webinar. Um, today we've got Mark Nichols and Gary Potter from Kingspan. Um, they will be discussing heat networks and secondary installation systems. So I'm going to hand over to these guys who know far more about it than me. And uh, I'm sure they'll give you a little introduction to who they are and what they do at Kingspan. Fantastic. So I'll, I'll start by uh, introducing myself. Uh, my name's Gary Potter, and I'm the Building Services Product Manager for the Midlands and Wales. I've got around 10 years experience in the HVAC building services industry, and I work with contractors, designers, engineers uh, from, initial, from initial uh, concept design stage uh, through to on-site visits, ensuring projects are designed and delivered to the, the best possible insulation standards. Um, I'm going to be covering Mark whilst he does the, the, the presentation today. Obviously, if we have any technical glitches, um, then by all means, I'll be taking over. So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll just hand over to Mark and, and Mark, you take over from here. Oh, well, thank you, Gary. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as mentioned, I'm Mark Nichols from Kingspan Technical Installation. So I'm the National Business Development Manager um, looking after our building services installation products. So basically all pipe duct work insulation. Um, here today to talk to you about pipe insulation, secondary insulation systems, specifically around district heating networks and the connections inside the building and the new CP1 2020 document and how that impacts on insulation. Uh, as we go through, if you've got any questions, just put them in the Q&A box of the chat. Uh, got a couple of point uh, times set aside as we're going through, just to look at any questions. So just ask them as they come up and we'll come back to them, hopefully before we get too far away from the topic. Um, and we'll crack on. I've introduced myself. So we'll talk about what we're looking at today. So this is about heat networks, uh, what they are, where the industry is going, why they're important, and where the thermal insulation requirements come in. We'll be looking at the SIBSI CP1 2020 code of practice uh, and look at what it's trying to achieve. Uh, how we use the code of practice, and finally, what the full installation system looks like. So to give a bit of an introduction to district heating in general, currently it accounts for around 2% of heat generation in the UK, uh, but in order to meet the UK's net carbon zero goals by 2050, they want to get this up to a minimum of 18% of all heat generation, uh, with at least 10% by 2030. So that's quite an ambitious goal. So you're going to see a lot of additional heat networks coming online within the next sort of six, seven, eight years, uh, potentially a lot sooner. Um, we're going to be looking at different types of heat networks. So if we think about it currently, a lot of jobs out there are third generation, which means they're powered by things like gas CHP, uh, waste to energy plants, uh, so centralized sources of heat with that water heated up and transported to the developments to connect into the building. We've got then fourth generation, which you're all probably more than aware with being from a heat pump association, uh, which is more low carbon technologies, such as heat pumps, ground, water source, and air source, um, and then potentially up to fifth generation. So today we'll cover mostly third and fourth generation heat networks. Um, fifth generation are a bit different because there's still a bit of a contention if they even are heat networks. Uh, at the moment, so I'll focus on third and fourth and where CP1 covers them. Um, and we'll crack on to 
CP1. So currently CP1 is an update on the old 2015 edition. When it comes to thermal insulation, uh, it's got a big extended uh, guidance piece. The old edition used to just have a simple paragraph that said EG use 40 mil thick phenolic insulation. Uh, whereas now there's an entire uh, objective and category set around thermal insulation. So CP1 is currently a voluntary code, but it says that if you're using it, don't just consider it guidance, consider it the minimum standard that you're working to. And um, we are finding a lot of clients employing consultancies to check that CP1 is being followed through from design all the way to implementation. Uh, Bayes have announced its intention to legislate during this parliament around CP1 to make it compulsory within heat network priority areas, uh, which includes reference to CIPSI CP1. Um, the CP1 document is massive. It's gone from, I think it was 70 something pages to nearly 300. Um, there's a lot of extended guidance of which thermal insulation is just one small element of it. So if you're working on heat network projects, it is worth keeping the whole document a uh, glance over and understanding it because it go, starts all the way at energy centers, talks about primary heat networks, onto the secondary insulation, which we're talking about, then talks about the tertiary systems. So there's a lot more to this document than just insulation, but we'll talk about our one little bit of it. So we're covering the objective 3.9, which we'll go into in a bit more detail. We're focused purely on the secondary heat network, and that is from the plate heat exchanger or building heat meter through to the HIU. We're not concerned about the below ground pipe work that connects to the building. We're not concerned about inside the apartment on the other side of the HIU. We are purely concerned about that secondary network. There is a big focus in the document about minimizing the total length of pipe work within the building through good design. So we'll touch on that in a few slides time, but we're essentially looking at more vertical risers uh, and less horizontal distribution pipe work in order to minimize the lengths. So it also says that when you're looking at designing and specifying insulation, you need to take into account the cost benefit of using additional insulation. So that's on the actual operating cost of the system, the CO2 impact, so what that does on the carbon for running the system, but also you need to think about overheating. So while all three of these points might be covered by the insulation bits we're gonna talk about, they still need to be considered independently to make sure they're being thought about. And finally, most of the methodology within CP1 is based upon SIPSI Guide C and the standard methodology within BS uh, 5422-2009. However, there is one slight difference in that it wants you to use an ambient temperature within the building, which is more realistic than the assumed conditions. So it suggests using 20 degrees ambient conditions inside a building, but if you've got other areas that are exposed like car parks, then taking that, that into account and doing your uh, calculations accordingly. So the way that CP1 is laid out is essentially got key outputs and it's got best practice. So the key outputs are what you need to do and what you need to log and keep evidence of and the best practice is what you need to aim towards. There are also some maximum permissible figures in there uh, to give you a sort of a range of guidance. So the outputs for thermal insulation, so for 3.9, you should have an optimized internal network design, uh, keep warm and in HIU requirements. When it says output three, that's stage three design that should be happening. Um, for output 3.9b, you should have your detailed internal pipe work insulation specification. And finally, you should actually have all your network heat losses calculations to support this. It shouldn't be a case of, oh yes, we want British standard thicknesses, whatever the standards say for that size, no, you need to actually calculate all your losses and demonstrate that. Uh, there is a Excel spreadsheet that goes along with CP1, where you, uh, which is where you log where you're storing this evidence and to demonstrate that it's been done. So the best practice targets that we're aiming to achieve for the secondary installation system are to achieve a total annual heat loss from the secondary pipe work and other equipment within the building of less than 550 kilowatt hours per dwelling per year. So that emphasis there on per dwelling means that this applies to predominantly residential developments. There is further guidance coming out, I believe, in the new BS5422 for non-residential heat network developments, but CP1 is focused mostly around residential. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with that metric of kilowatt hours per dwelling per year, you'd be forgiven because it's new, 
within the standard is not something that's really been considered before in that way. Uh, but we'll talk about how you calculate that in a couple of slides. And the best practice is also to avoid the use of any distribution pipe working corridors by using multiple risers and minimizing the total lengths. So there is a thickness insulation table within CP1, which is based upon the work of ACOM done in 2014 for the London Borough of Islington, um, which is this table eight within the document. So this is a big improvement on that reference in the old edition to just EGU 40 mil. Uh, phenolic insulation, as you can see, it's got differentiation between that internal and external space where you're using different ambient conditions. It's got multiple types of insulation, so phenolic and mineral wool, and it's actually got some pipe sizes. What it's essentially saying is that inside of a building, you should have nothing bigger than 80 nominal bore pipe. Everything should be 15 to 80. Uh, you shouldn't have anything larger to sort of minimize those heat losses. So as great as the table is, it does have its limitations. Um, so for example, it's got thicknesses for phenolic and mineral wool listed the same thickness, even though they perform quite differently. The table is based upon certain conditions uh, and lambda values of insulation, which aren't correct for the temperatures we're talking about at CP1, which we'll talk, touch on now. So when it comes to thermal insulation, historically, all manufacturers declare in line with C markings. We declare our thermal performance at a 10 degree uh, mean temperature. Uh, however, when you're working on heat network projects, you work at much higher temperatures. So you should consult the, whichever manufacturer you're working with, you should consult their uh, literature to find out their lambda values at the temperatures that you're working with. So whereas the previous table references phenolic at 0.025 and mineral fiber at 0.035, more realistically at the temperatures we're talking about, mineral wool sort of in the range of 0.037 to 39, depending on the random manufacturer. Our cool therm phenolic is more like 0.026 to 27, depending on the temperature. Other phenolics can be up in the 0.029s, 30s, which is why it's really important when you're doing your calculations for CP1, that you identify which insulation it is you want to use and actually use that manufacturer's data to make the calculations as accurate as possible, because it will vary depending if you're using brand A, brand B or brand C of insulation. So to give you guys an idea of what the actual impact is of those differences in performance. So if we look at CP1 as it's published in table eight, there's about a 36 to 37% performance difference where you've got the 50 mil phenolic versus the 50 mil mineral wool. Um, and then when you go to 60 mil mineral wool, the difference is more like 22 to 24%. So a significant difference, which really impacts when we come onto this um, methodology we we're talking about. However, if we use the actual lambda values of the insulation at the temperatures we're talking about, that difference increases. So it's more like between 38 to 39%, and on the larger sizes, between 25 to 31%. So it's really important to understand what you're trying to achieve, what thicknesses you need. So if we have a look at the thickness of mineral wool, you need to get to the same performance as the stated phenolic. So again, this is all based upon the actual th lambda values within the CP1 table and the assumed conditions. Uh, it's somewhere from sort of 90 to 120 mil thickness comparison. If you're wondering why the thickness of mineral wool goes down, the bigger the pipe size gets, which is a bit counterintuitive, it's because rather than having a set watts per meter heat loss, as you might have in say a British standards table or the carbon trust tables, we're comparing to the performance of 50 mil phenolic at that pipe size. And that thickness isn't changing on the pipe size. So that therefore to get the same performance, the actual thickness of mineral wool you need goes down because they, uh, the greater the size of the pipe, the greater the heat loss. So you can see that the thickness of mineral wool gets quite large, which can be quite impractical on site uh, due to constraints within ceiling void spaces. If we go the other way and say that 50 mil mineral fiber is within that table, so what thickness of phenolic do you need to achieve the same result? It's about half or half plus five, which is interesting because it's broadly in line with the carbon trust table uh, insulation standards. Um, however, all those tables and thicknesses are actually a bit moot because what you actually have to do, and if you, are interested in thermal insulation and you're having to calculate to a CP1 standard, 
this is possibly the most important part of this entire presentation. You need to comply with clause 3.9.8. I realize that sounds awfully dry. <laughs> Essentially, this tells you exactly how it is that you calculate it. So you need to take your total annual heat loss from the secondary system, so between the plate heat exchanger and the HIU, and then you need to uh, divide that by the number of dwellings. So your maximum permissible figure that you're allowed is 876 kilowatt hours per dwelling per year, which equates to 100 watts a dwelling on average with 2.4 kilowatt hours per day. Um, and keep in mind, we had the best practice target at 550. So what it's saying is that you cannot be worse than 876. The performance you're aiming for is 550. And depending on your project conditions, because every project will be different, you're probably somewhere in the middle. So in order to do this calculation, you need to have done your, done your heat loss calculations through the thickness of your insulation in your given conditions, which is why you need a specific manufacturer's data to work with, because you need to know their lambda value within your project conditions, which will give you your heat loss, which is why those tables are a bit moot, because depending on your conditions, you might need more than that 50 mil, you might need less than that 50 mil, it all depends what you're trying to achieve. So if we have a look at some case studies, uh, which were designed prior to the new CP1, so this example was kindly given to us by White Coat Design Associates. This is based on uh, one of the phases at Battersea Power Station. It was designed to the Carbon Trust Energy Technology List levels of insulation, uh, a 70 degree mean flow temperature. So to the methodology, they would have achieved a 1,071 kilowatt hours per dwelling per year loss, which is above that uh, maximum acceptable 876. And if they redesigned the project and used 50 mil for like throughout, that would have brought the heat loss down to less than 300,000 kilowatt hours per year, which would have brought it down to 777 kilowatt hours per dwelling uh, per year. So it used to show that some projects before, would, which were compliant with the old CP1, won't be compliant with the new CP1. Um, this is an example uh, given to us by here in Colleague Consulting Engineers. So. They use the new CP1 standard on our recent project, much lower flow and return temperatures than the Battersea example, and their kilowatt hours are down at 642 kilowatt hours per dwelling per year. So well within that maximum acceptable, but still actually a bit short of the best practice. So just because you're using the new CP1 standard doesn't mean that you're going to achieve the best practice. There's a lot more, um, what's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> There's a lot more detail that goes into it than that. So if we have a look at some uh, previous examples, so project B was taken from a pre-CP1 2020 project where they used the energy technology list levels of insulation, again, a lower flow and return, and they were able to show compliance with the project at these 25, 30, 35 mil thick levels of phenolic. So they were within the maximum acceptable, but still well short of the best practice. So it is possible to achieve this with a thinner insulation solution. Um, but another project, which was, again, ahead of its time, so you used 50 mil phenolic and then larger, where it had larger pipe sizes, again, lower flow and return, so more in line with this fourth generation heat pump system, again, came out in the 700s. So what we're finding is that if you're just using the CP1 tables, if you're running at a standard operating condition of about 75 degrees, you're probably there or thereabouts for 50 mil. If you've got a lower flow temperature, you can potentially go for smaller thickness, but you'll need to go bigger if you want to chase the best practice. And if you've got a older network that's running at a higher flow temperature, you're probably need, going to need to go up to sort of 60, 70 mil thickness of insulation in order to hit these parameters. So the reason that these flow temperatures have such a big impact is because the lower the flow temperature, the lower the heat loss, which sounds a bit obvious, but it is essentially that simple. So if we look at the difference between 75 degree down to 60 degree flow, um, every five degree that we lower the flow temperature, um, we decrease, decrease the heat loss by between 11 and 14 percent without adjusting insulation thicknesses. So this is why a project at 75 degrees, which needs 50 mil, might not need it down at 60 degrees flow. And as we're heading more into fourth generation heat networks, uh, say if we're using a ground source heat pump system, these are sort of the levels you're looking at. Although the question then is, just because I can use less insulation thickness, should I use it? Or should I then be chasing after that 550 as long as I've got the space, the requirements? 
And I think that'll be a job by job, project by project um, question to answer. So uh, TP1 has this Excel spreadsheet that comes along with it. So this has got, I think something like 500 outputs in total of which installation is three, maybe four of it. Um, but essentially you need to make sure the output has been completed and evidence of where you've stored that evidence is done. So the heat loss calculations and the detailed installation specification in this case, and you also need to keep your stage two heat loss calculations as well, the initial calculations. If you're not familiar with this Excel spreadsheet and you are working on heat network projects, please at least have a look at the CPU one and the Excel spreadsheet because you just need to be aware about where it applies, where it affects yourselves. So coming back to this point about uh, pipe work layout and the emphasis on more risers. So historically in residential developments, example A here is probably what you're familiar with. So you've got a single riser shaft, long distribution runs with branches off into the apartment and the HIU might be anywhere within that apartment. So the problem with that is that you've got long branches of distribution, longer branches out into the apartments and the more the greater length of pipe work you've got, the more heat loss you've got. More recently, you're probably familiar with example B, where you've again got a single riser shaft with long distribution down the corridors with short branches to the HIUs just inside the apartment. Again, slightly better than A because you've shortened that final run. But what CP1 is saying, if you want to aim for these sort of 550 best practice targets, what you need is the multiple riser approach. So where you've got, I think usually it's a single riser to the roof, distribution along there with dropping down through multiple risers servicing two, maybe three HIUs at a time. Uh, this shortens the overall run because you've not got flow and return lengths down every single corridor along the development. You just got the flows to the top along and then down the risers and back into the system. We, what I would say is that since we've been working on CP1 2020 projects, the only ones that are getting near this 550 target are the ones using the multiple riser approach, uh, using traditional long distributions in the corridors. We've seen some in the 600s, most are coming out in the 700s, and a few are still into the 800s. So if you are chasing best practice, you do need to look at the riser shaft situation, but it's not just as simple as saying, we're gonna have a few more riser shafts in there because that needs to be considered early in the design, agreed with the architect and have that space made ready. So that's more of a, whole project design consideration. It's not something as a specifier or designer, you can just say, oh yeah, we're gonna have multiple risers here, here and here, because it's not quite that simple. But it needs to be considered early, early design stage if you're going down this route. So some final points just to mention on what CP1 says about insulation is that you also need to take into account the full system. So historically, when we're doing calculations and designs, uh, let's say we're working in BIM, Revit, we're doing our calculations, we know that there are 5,000 meters of a 32 nominal bore pipe in this building. So I'll just do my heat loss per pipe size, times it by my length, and I've got my heat loss. It's not quite that simple because inside of a building, you've got pipe supports on that pipe run, you've got valves, you've got flanges, you've got drain cocks, you've got anchors, you've got everything else that's part of that pipework system that's never historically been allowed for in the calculations. So when you're looking back when it's completely in operation and wondering why is my heat loss so much higher than what I've designed to, it's probably because you've got all this lost heat along the way from points you've not allowed for in the calculation. So what it's saying is that these valves, flange and things shall be insulated, the, the pipe support shall use a load bearing insulation uh, where the clip is to reduce that heat loss. Uh, the third point I'll read out because I, as a phenolic manufacturer, I don't necessarily agree with it, but it's in the standard. And that's the insulation shall be continuous and close fitting all joints and include a vapor seal, particularly important for phenolic insulation, which is susceptible to decay where vapor seal is not maintained. I suspect this is more from below ambient pipe work, where if you get moisture under the insulation system, it can be a cause of corrosion, but that's the case on all insulation. You don't tend to see that on Above ambient pipe work, because any moisture that gets to the pipe evaporates away from the heat of the pipe. Um, but to be fair, maintaining a good vapor seal and insulation is good practice wherever you are in the building. So I don't necessarily agree with the message. I just don't really understand the particular importance for phenolic. 
And finally, you need to consider things like Legionella control. So your heating pipe work should not be run adjacent to or below cold water pipe work in order to keep those temperatures low and prevent Legionella. In practice, the way I'm seeing this mostly implemented is having separate risers and distribution for the heating and the chill, especially if they're adopting this multiple riser approach. If they go in the multiple risers, they tend to be uh, doing the more traditional route for chill and cold pipe work and the uh, multiple risers for the heating, completely separating them out. And then going back to the much earlier point we're saying about considering things like overheating, if you're not running the heating pipe work through the corridor, odds are you're helping to eliminate your problem of corridor overheating before it even becomes a problem because you're putting it into those riser shafts. So before we move on to the next part of the presentation, which is about this full system insulation approach and why it's important to insulate these things and what standards cover it, just take a short break and just see if there's any questions so far. Any? There's nothing at the moment in the Q&A or the chat. Well. Cool. Well, I'll just remind you guys if you've got any questions, please feel free to pop them in there. Um, if there's nothing I'm doing at the moment, we can carry straight on and then come back to questions towards the end. Yep, nothing, nothing yet, Mark. More. Cool. Yep. So we mentioned pipe support. So you've probably seen them on site. Uh, historically, wooden blocks have been used, rubber line clips. But what CP1 is saying is that you should be following. Uh, this figure 12 of BS5970, which is where you should have a load bearing piece of insulation around the uh, pipe with the actual hanging clip going around the outside of the insulation. Um, as you notice, the detail here says that wooden blocks should not be used. Historically, that was mostly below ambient where you might have condensation form. But for heating, it's because the film performance of wood is so much worse compared to insulation. So the overall um, diameter of the wooden block heats up and radiates additional heat. Same for rubber line clips. Um, you tend to find additional heat loss going up the hanger rod into the supporting system because it's transferring through the metal. So what I'm saying is you shouldn't be using rubber line clips there. There is a, another figure within the standard, which is figure 13, which is non-preferred, which is if you are using something like a metal clip or rubber line clip, you should be insulating over the top of it and four times that thickness of the thread rod. When it comes to CP1, I'm not sure how practical it is to have 200 mil thickness of insulation at the thread rod, which is why uh, they tend to go towards the insulated support route. Uh, it's important to, that any insulation used at the support points should be load bearing because they have to take the weight of the pipe. So this picture here is actually a bad example of what a pipe support looks like because someone's taken standard pipe insulation cut it down and use that as the, put, as the pipe support. The problem with doing this is that standard pipe insulation is around 37 kg density, whereas pipe supports start at 60 kg, and they've potentially got metal spreader plates depending on the size of the pipe to help spread the load. If you don't have the correct density or the load bearing capacity at those points, you'll find that once the system is operation, it will start to crush, and you see failures at the pipe supports. Um, this is, one of the main reasons why, if you've got good eyes, you can see on our render here of the pipe support, we use a Kingspan Lion so that you can differentiate it at a distance to see which is the correct product. So our pipe supports always have a icon of a lion, whereas our pipe insulation always says Kingspan called them in writing. So you can differentiate which is the correct material. These thermal images give you an idea of the performance difference between in our case, a phenolic pipe support, a rubber line clip, metal clip, and wooden block. Um, you can see where the heat transfer is happening up the thread rod in these cases and on the wooden block along the full length of support. So essentially, you're trying to mitigate any additional heat loss from the system through these points you've not necessarily accounted for. Um, the next point to discuss is valves, and this is possibly the single biggest point to address heat loss within a system, which is why CP1 touches on it. So the carbon trust um, has come out and said that each valve is equivalent of a meter of uninsulated pipe work, which keep in mind, uninsulated pipe versus an insulated heating pipe can be up to 17 times the amount of heat loss. If you try and look on what that's based upon, it's actually quite difficult to find any data. So what the European Industrial Insulation Foundation did was a case study 
looking at a 100 nominal bore valve running at 75 degree all years round. They found that an uninsulated valve was losing around 2,240 kilowatt hours, whereas if they insulated to the carbon trust energy technology level of insulation, that reduced it down to 153. So there's over 2,000 kilowatt hours saved uh, in that example, which depending on your cost of heat in your building, and this has changed a lot in the last uh, 12 months. Uh, in this case, we calculate the 15 pence a kilowatt hour, which is about 300 pound a year per valve. So there's a lot of saving to be had on there. And that's what I was saying in other presentations. If you're looking for easy savings within the system, look at your valves first, because that's your biggest area of uncalculated loss. So just to put this valve into perspective, a little bit of a game uh, with it being on Zoom, I won't open it up. But essentially, how far do we think we that lost heat from a valve would get an electric car per year? 250 miles, 1,000, 2,500. Quite simply, it's over 2,500 when you convert that heat into electricity. So it's a lot of wasted power, a lot of wasted heat over the course of the year if you're not insulating your valves correctly. So the picture on the top left here, it looks like a pretty well insulated system. We've got insulation, we've got valve covers on it. The system should actually be quite efficient. But actually when you put thermal imaging on it, uh, the insulation at the valves is actually where all the heat's being lost. And that's because if you think about traditional valve jackets that go on at these points, they're not a rigid foam insulation such as our phenolic. They tend to be made by a converter or specialist manufacturer. Um, a Velcro bag filled up with a form of mineral wool wrapped around it as sort of a nominal 25, 50 mil thickness and sealed. So if you go and look for thermal performance data on a valve uh, bag, I've never been able to find any. It's not a manufactured product that's manufactured to a standard. So it's actually hard to calculate this even if you're trying to calculate the heat loss um, because it's not just going to be a perfect, oh yeah, that valve isn't set to the same level as the insulation because it's not the same sort of manufacturing process and declarations you're working to. So thinking about where there's heat loss and how to allow for that in your design is actually really quite important. And the picture on the right shows where a uh, rubber line clip was used on a heating system. You can see the heat being lost at that gap. So furthermore, heat can be lost elsewhere in the system just by the way that things are done on site, the way that things are installed. So if we start with this top left, this is where a piece of duct wrap is being used around a flange. It's actually quite difficult to get a vapor seal between a insulation and a flexible insulation like a duct wrap. So you tend to find moisture ingress, which is where you get problems like corrosion. The same on external, if we look at the top right here, you've got a pipe support that's been installed by the pipe work contractor, uh, quite well in fact, put the clip around it. Then the thermal insulation contractor has come in, they've insulated up to it, put their vapor seal in place as you would. And then the thermal insulation contractors cladded over their own work, they've not cladded over the pipe contractors work, which has meant that the pipe supports then don't have any weatherproofing, which then leaves it open to moisture ingress where you might get rainwater getting under the insulation, giving you problems like corrosion, affecting the quality of the insulation and affecting the system performance. In this example, we have almost the opposite problem. So a pipe work contract has actually put protective sleeves around the pipe supports to protect them, which is actually fairly good practice. However, when you come along to it, then install the insulation, bring up to it, how do you actually get a vapor seal between the insulation and the pipe support? Because you've got that overhanging um, cladding, it's actually quite difficult. So if any moisture does get under that top, it's got a path down to the pipe, which then can cause future issues. This picture at the bottom left is a example of A, it's a wooden block, which BS5970 should not, so should not be used, but B, the pipe works installed a long time before the insulation is in some cases. So you could have a pipe support sitting exposed to the elements for weeks, months at a time before it's actually finally insulated. So what is the condition of the insulation, the pipe support, the pipe before it's even insulated? Is it going to do the job that you need it to do? Are you getting the performance from that product from that point that you think you will? So on the similar point of exterior, this bottom right hand picture here is where a uh, PIB has been used. 
I don't think I need to talk about the massive gap in the weatherproofing on this pipe. But it's worth mentioning the emissivity of the cladding. So for those of you who haven't encountered emissivity before, it's essentially the finish on the insulation. So insulation is provided to market with this bright silver finish as standard. Um, for heating pipe work, that's beneficial because it affects the way in which heat radiates and reflects away from the surface of the pipe. When you change that surface by, say, applying a paint, a, an additional foil, a PIB, any sort of cladding, then the emissivity of that new cladding takes precedence over what was there before, which if you change a silver finish to a black finish, it means that heat will transfer more readily through, which means that you actually need to increase your insulation thickness to do the same job. Conversely, on chill and coal pipe work, adding something like a high emissivity PIB or foil is actually beneficial because it helps with condensation control. But again, it's that nuance of what impact is this cladding having on the performance of the insulation under it? And it's actually more than people think. So this is another place where you think, okay, I've calculated I need 25 mil insulation. I've put it out there, I've cladded it, waterproofed it, and now it's not doing the job, what's going on? It might just be a case of the emissivity is making that perform worse than you calculated. Um, this picture on the left was a project that was left, I think, over COVID. It wasn't fully watertight. I came back and this, believe it or not, was a wooden block, which had um, beginning to grow mold of all things. The pipe work underneath it, you can only see elements of corrosion happening. And again, it's just that point of, is the pipe work, is the support actually fit for purpose when it's being installed? And this picture at the top is taken from a district heating project where we had thermal insulation into a wooden block, which then goes into a flange, which has been covered with duct wrap and continued. So in your traditional calculations, let's say this is a 100 meter run, you would calculate for 100 meters of insulation, where actually every two to three meters, you've got a repeated pipe support and flange giving you worse heat loss. So it's all about how you're allowing for that. The final point we'd like to make on this is all about the installation quality. So we recommend the installation installed by TECO, which is the Thermal Installation Contracts Association, they run the CSCS skill card scheme. So in theory, operatives on site should have been through the assessment center at Darlington for TICA. Um, the main reason is it gives you a reassurance of quality and gives you somebody to go back to if there's issues with the state of the work. I'd say 75% of the issues we go to look at on site are caused by uh, some form of poor installation or damage. If you've got, got someone who's a member of a registered association, it gives you a point of address if you have issues with this. So what King's Run can offer on this, we've got installation videos that show you how insulation should be on. This isn't designed for a contractor to go and start cutting it and put it on site. It's more of a case of this is how it should be done and this is what a good job looks like. But where we're mostly called in is with these heat loss calculations. So looking at the given conditions for the site, calculating what our actual heat loss is through it to allow it to be plugged into that 3.9.8 calculation to give that exact heat loss. So if we're given the project conditions, we can give you our heat loss per meter, which then goes into the calculations. What we've done for some projects is what we call project specific tech, uh, tech subs or technical submittals, where we essentially put this all into a project specific document that says, okay, this amount of meters, this heat loss, this thickness, to make it nice and easy uh, for contractors on site. Uh, coming towards the end of the presentation, so, we know a lot of people who work in BIM, et cetera. So if you want the files for our products, they're all online. I'm not gonna go into details on it. If there's something you need that's not there, just contact us. We have internal uh, BIM engineers who can make items. So the thing you need, let us know. I won't go through this in too much detail. Uh, it's usually at this point in the presentation, we're asked about various different levels of performance, whether it's uh, thermal, fire, environmental, or just third party approvals. So all there for you to have a look at. Uh, I think the only thing not on there is we also have EPDs available for our pipe insulation. Um, they're all available on the website if you want that. So to summarise, as the UK looks to meet its net carbon zero goals, the use of heat network is expected to grow rapidly over the next few years. CP1 is currently a voluntary code which sets minimum standards and recommends best practice. Uh, but if you're using it, stick to it essentially. 
Uh, CPU one stipulates a minimum thickness of insulation for specified sizes for both mineral fiber and phenolic, but be aware that you need to do the 3.9.8 calculation, uh, which will affect what thickness you actually need to use. Don't get too distracted or just put in that table thinking it will meet the requirements of CPU one, because depending on your project conditions, it might not. Um, and finally, you need to take into account the full insulation system. It's not just about the length of pipe insulation, it's about all the other details and how you account for that and think about that heat loss in total for the system. Because when we, you're going back when it's in use and looking at the performance gap, these are the points that you're going to lose it. And depending where you are in the country, I know uh, the London plan, for example, is looking at B scene, which is looking back at those uh, performance gaps and how they can be addressed. Again, CP1 does the same, looking at the actual in use to make sure it's meeting design criteria. So it's really important to make sure that everything is logged, recorded, and you're thinking about the full system. So if you've got any questions, you can contact our technical team um, on the below emails. Uh, I think my details have been sent out in regards to the seminar as well, and Gary's. So if you've got questions, please let us know. We're here to help. And um, yeah, we've got people all around the country as well. So if you're working in different parts, there's someone around the country where you happen to be, feel free to give them a call or drop them an email. But thank you. That's it for me. I'm wondering if we've got any questions, anything come up while we've been talking. Hi, Mark. I've just had a quick look. No, nothing at the moment, Fred. So I think you've wowed everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> oh, we've just got one now. Here we go. Um, we need to include this. Sorry, this is from Ken Gordon. We need to include the embodied carbon for pipe insulation in our designs. Where can we find the EPD figures for Cool Firm? Um, that is online. Well, our EPD is online on the website, so you can go on there and download it. Um, I can probably give you guys a sneak peek at something which isn't publicly available yet, but which will be in January which is a new calculator tool, which we are developing, which will essentially um, do that for you. If I can get it to you work right now. I might need to stop sharing the screen to get it up. But yes, essentially we're developing a new tool, essentially with that in mind and with CP1. So if we put this up. too and share so yeah this is a new tool that's coming you'll essentially put in the pipe size you want the length of pipe work and it will give you our embodied carbon data for british standards um the etl standards or cp1 so this is still in development so come and speak to me or gary in the new year if you're interested in this because we will you just put in your full length and it'll give you the embodied carbon based upon the actual meters lengths of carbon for it. But this is a question we're getting a lot at the moment. So if you've got any more questions around carbon, please let us know. Thanks for that, Mark. Um, always like a sneak peek. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's been a good last three months of my life. So hopefully in January, we'll have that version of that tool available for people to look at. That's made it all feel very special now. You shared that. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, we've no more questions. Um, oh, 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 yeah, you've got thank you as well on that one. So you thanks for being there as well. So thank you, Mark, and thank you, Gary. I uh, appreciate you spending your time. Certainly taught me a few things today. Anyway, so I'm always learning. So uh, just, again, I'm sure everyone's appreciated what you've done. Uh, this was broadcast live, so it'll be on our YouTube channel. Feel free to share. Just a couple of notes for the diaries. The 23rd of March is the Ground Soil Seat Pump Association members day which is free to members and their guests so if you want some more information about that and our um conference and uh, charity dinner on the 29th of september in hull um just drop me a line at info at gshp.org.uk um thank you very much and as this is the last one before christmas i want to wish you all a very merry christmas and we'll see you all in the new year thank you everyone cool thank you everyone for listening yes. Merry Christmas, everybody.